welcome to another episode of the Bless and Boss Up podcast. Today's episode is called You Worship What You Worry About. Before we get there, can we just go back to last week for a second? If you have not listened to last week's episode, go back. It was called Winning the Victory Over Yourself. I shared a message that God shared with me as I was praying about the episode. Got a little stuck. So I took it back to him, like, what's going on? Am I missing a message? Um, and he gave me a message to deliver. And I was still thinking about this that message this week. And I really enjoyed that show. Like, I was really on a high after recording that podcast. And I was still thinking about it this week because if you guys have been listening long enough, you know, especially when it comes to faith-based things, I do not want to just hype you up to do nothing. <laughs> I want to give you something practical to do so that you can take everything that we discuss here on this show back to God, back to, to his feet so that he can give you revelation for yourself. I don't want anything that I say on this platform to be an end all be all. No, it's just to encourage you and maybe provide some insight as God gives me, but really to encourage you to go back to him for yourself so that you can get, get the specific revelation that's for you. Now, as I was thinking about last week's episode, though, I ended up in Habakkuk. Now, I ended up here because I was thinking about this week's podcast as well. Like, um, I have a list of topics. Usually, as God drops topics in my spirit, like I put it in my phone. If I'm on, on the computer, I'll put it in the computer. But I always write it down so that I can go back to it. And then in prayer time, that's when I build out like the show outline before coming on to record it. So. I was in Habakkuk because I have a show that I, uh, a show topic that involves Habakkuk, but as I was in it, it brought me back to last week's episode about relentlessness and just really not letting up on your pursuit of God and, and what he has for you and what he wants to do in you and through you. So I was cracking up for lack of a better word, because as I was in Habakkuk, I was like, you know, why every time... I hear about the book of Habakkuk. It could just be me, but every time I hear about this particular book in the Bible, it is always in reference to goal setting because a lot of people reference Habakkuk 2 2. Uh, write the vision, make it plain on tablets. Uh, the vision is for an appointed time, it, it won't be delayed. That's uh, chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. And I was in there because I was. Um, I wanted to talk about one of my episodes. I want to talk about making it plain because there's a lot of like practical things. I feel like there is a lot of weight in that make it plain part because I believe in some translations it says, uh, write the vision, make it plain so that a runner could uh, take it or something like that, but making it clear enough to where somebody else could then take it and see it out. And it's not like a game of telephone where by the time it gets to somebody else, it's not what God told you in a sense. And so I feel like there's a lot there as opposed to being clear and practical about what you're doing when you're building your business. And I wanted to elaborate on that as it relates to business building. But for me, when I read the Bible, and I'm sharing this because I, I would hope that these habits make it easier for you to read the word as well. When I read the Bible, before I even go to the particular topic or the particular scripture that I want to go to, I do a few things so that I can understand the context of what I'm reading. I believe a big mistake that a lot of people make when it comes to uh, the word and communicating it is that we find scriptures to fit our opinions and we don't make our opinions fit what the truth is. And it is so backwards. And it what it does is it puts a lot of people in, a lot of people of faith, leaders of faith, into a motivational space as opposed to a teaching space to where you're really teaching and articulating the word of God as it is, not as you feel like it should be or not in a way to where you're making it fit to your opinion, if that makes sense. And so something that I really want to do, not just as I communicate the word, because aside from whatever platform I have, like I'm responsible for my soul. I'm responsible for making sure I live a righteous life. I'm remaining humble. I'm remaining at God's feet. So when I'm reading, I want to make sure that I'm interpreting the word for as it is, not what I want it to be or what I think it should be to fit whatever point I'm trying to make. So 
the first thing I do is instead of going straight to the particular scripture. So like I said, I wanted to go to two, two and three because I wanted to talk a little bit more about business and um, making your business clear and all of those things. So instead of going there, step one for me is always reading what is this book about? So it's called Habakkuk. Who is Habakkuk? What is the point of this book? Where did it take where did it take place? All of the who, what, whens, whys, and hows are important. Now, the resources that I use, again, I'm, I'm sharing with you because I will hope that you would, would adopt similar habits so that you can better understand the word as well. Like we have to understand the text. God and his word are one. And so if you want more of God, you have to get into his word. If you want to hear from God, you have to go to his word. If you want to know what God wants you to do for X situation, you have to go to his word. We can't live this life out being biblically illiterate at all. And we can't live this life out only having a biblical understanding based off of what someone else told us. And that's not to say that you shouldn't have leadership or anything like that. That is not what I mean at all. What I'm saying, though, is we are responsible for making sure that we are reading the word and not understanding it is not an excuse. So, again, I'm sharing with you these habits and hopes that you adopt them so that you can get a you can then use these similar tips or tools to get a better understanding of the word for yourself. So I look at the context. One place that I go to is the Bible Project on YouTube. I love them. If you're a visual person, I highly suggest checking out the Bible Project. And they have just a visual illustration of every book in the Bible. So if I'm looking at Habakkuk, I'm like, okay, cool. Let me go to my people over at the Bible Project, see what they're talking about. I go through the whole illustration. Okay, I kind of understand. I get the general gist. But it, it wasn't making sense to me because I'm like, well, every time I hear about Habakkuk, I'm thinking about goal setting because that's the bit of the scripture that I've always heard. So I go back to the book. I have the Life Application Study Bible. I love it. And I read the introduction. And if you're following me on YouTube or watching this on video, this is the Bible right here. It's very, very thick. And I read the introduction that is in the front. And I'm going to read this to you guys because this piggybacks off the point of being relentless. So it says Habakkuk, the vital statistics here are that the purpose of Habakkuk is to show that the book of Habakkuk is to show that God is still in control of the world, despite the apparent triumph of evil. So it's written by Habakkuk. The original audience is the people of Judah, and it was written between 612 and 589 B.C. The setting of this was Babylon was becoming the dominant world power and Judah will soon feel Babylon's destructive force. And so the key people here is Habakkuk and the Babylonians. Now, Habakkuk in his text was talking to God most of the time. Like he wasn't even this is a conversation that we get insight on um, between Habakkuk and God. So the introduction says from the innocent childhood queries to complex university discussions. Life is filled with questions, asking you how and why and when we probe beneath the surface to find satisfying answers. But not all questions have answers wrapped and neatly tied. These unanswered interrogations create more questions and nagging and that spirit destroying doubt. Some choose to live with their doubts, ignoring them and moving on with life. Others become cynical and hardened. But many reject those options and continue to ask, looking for answers. Habakkuk was a man who sought answers. Troubled by what he observed, he asked difficult questions. Those questions were not merely intellectual exercises or bitter complaints. Habakkuk saw a dying world and it broke his heart. Why is there evil in the world? Why do the wicked seem to be winning? He boldly and confidently took his complaints directly to God. And God answered with an avalanche of proof and prediction. The prophet's question and God's answers are recorded in this book. As we turn the pages, we are immediately confronted with his urgent cry. How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you don't come to save. In fact, most of the first chapter is devoted to his question. As chapter two begins, Habakkuk declares that he will wait to hear God's answers to his complaints. Then God begins to speak telling the prophet to write his answers plainly so that all will see and understand. It may seem, God says, as though the wicked triumph, but eventually they will be judged and righteousness will prevail. Judgment may not come quickly, but it will come. God's answers fill chapter two. 
Then Habakkuk conclu concludes this book with a prayer of triumph. With questions answered and a new understanding of God's power and love, Habakkuk rejoices in who God is and what he will do. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Listen to the profound questions that Habakkuk boldly brings to God and realize that you can also bring your complaints and inquiries to him. Listen to God's answers and rejoice that he is at work in the world and in your life. So I read that because I feel like we do, I feel like Habakkuk, the book, is an underutilized tool for us who have a lot of questions. And I believe that what prevents us from being relentless, as I talked about last week, is a lot of questions that we have for God that for whatever reason we're too afraid to ask, or maybe we just don't feel like we can ask because a lot of times, um, especially in uh, church settings, God is presented as this, I always talk about my personal experience, let me just say that, my experience growing up in church was that Christianity was just this rigid handbook that I had to follow and that my righteousness was graded based on my willingness or my ability to adhere to the rules. And so I saw a, a life of righteousness as constricting as opposed to really giving me freedom. And it was a misrepresentation or a misinterpretation on my part, whatever it is you want to call it. But I didn't know that I could go to God with these answers. And I remember there were times I was telling someone recently that my grandma took me to the, the pastor's office one time because my experience with church started off with her. She would take me to her church and I didn't grow up in church, but I went enough. And so I would be like, well, grandma, I remember one time they uh, were doing communion. I hope she doesn't listen to this because she will have an attitude, but <laughs> she um, they were doing communion. And um, they asked me, they were passing out the little gold plates with the community cups in it. And um, the guy asked me before letting me get one, like, have you been baptized uh, as far as in the water? And I said, no. And I was, a I was a child at this time. And he said, oh, you can't take communion. And I was kind of like, okay. I mean, I didn't know the, the word to really refute it, but it didn't feel right to me. It didn't make sense to me. And I was like, okay. So I remember asking my grandmother later that day, like, hey, how come the, the man told me that I couldn't take communion because I haven't been baptized in water? Like, am I not supposed to, to remember that Jesus died on the cross for my sins too? Like, I was confused by that rule. Then another time, um, something else happened and I had more questions. And eventually I stopped asking questions because she was getting annoyed with me. Like, girl, just sit down. <laughs> you know how... How folks are like, girl, just sit down, be quiet. And I did never felt like I could ask questions. And I feel like these days, as I work with or communicate with people of faith in like the society, or if I meet you in person or anything like that, a lot of times people genuinely feel like they can't ask questions. And because if you're not, if you, it's as if you're supposed to automatically know everything. And what I love about Habakkuk is that he had questions. He was like, God, one plus one is not equal in two. Why is all of this evil happening in the world? And why does it seem like the wicked are winning? This doesn't look right. I, I have questions and I'm going to sit here. Like, I, I really want to sit here. And he went with, to God with a relentless spirit. He wasn't willing to let up. He's like, look, I got questions and I'm going to sit here until you answer them. And God gave him answers. And that's what he was writing down on tablets and making it plain. But God gave him answers. God met him at his, his relentlessness. And so I wanted to talk about this briefly. This isn't going to take up the whole episode, but I wanted to explain, one, the importance of going back to the word. Two, provide you a couple of resources like um, gotquestions.org or biblestudytools.com or um, the Bible Project on YouTube, as well as a good study Bible, so that you can go back into the Word. And if you have questions, or you're somebody who feels like you can't go to God with your questions, and that's what's preventing you from really being all in with Him, and really committing to Him, not just for your business, but for your life, I suggest going and studying Habakkuk. It's not a long book at all. 
it's pretty bl black and white. The situation was stated. He had questions. God answered those questions and he prayed. That's the whole book. So I would suggest reading it and studying it. Get you a good study Bible um, and allow Habakkuk's relentlessness to inspire and fuel your own. So that was something real quick I wanted to share with you guys to piggyback off of last week. Now, let's get into today's top topic because I know you were probably like, when I said the title, girl, hold on now, what? Okay, hear me out. I'm reading this book right now. And this is why I love that I'm doing this on YouTube because I can show you guys the things. I'm reading this book. I, I'm about done. I have a few pages left. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. This book, I did not expect to get me together like that. I don't even know how I came across it. But as soon as I read the title, I said, oh, this is for me. Because one of the things that God has really told me to, to or my word or area mandate for this year is to focus and to have patience. And patience is not my strong suit, to be completely honest. I'm a very driven person. And... Um, I'm the type of person that's going to get things done, but I'm in a place, especially now, um, in a couple of weeks, I turned 30. And I, so of course, naturally I've been reflecting a lot on my twenties and I spent the majority of my twenties grinding. When I was 18, I went to college. When I got into college, I had multiple jobs. I worked at the admissions office where I gave campus tours and I worked there. I got a check and I got money for school. Then I became an RA so that I got my housing paid for and got another check and had the time of my life <laughs> doing that. Then I got an internship. So then I had two jobs plus an internship plus a full course load. Like I was doing the most trying to be successful and, and, and grind and reaching my goals and all of these things. I started a brand on campus where I had this women empowerment blog and I was doing so well. So I was just hustling. Then when I graduated, I got into the workforce. After a year of getting into the workforce, I started my business and then uh, that started with my youth program. And then I pivoted into doing coaching and then I landed on podcasting around that same time. So I have been grinding, going after my goals, knocking them jokers out the park, all of these things just constantly in the achievement mode. All of this by 30. I'm trying to do this by 30. I'm trying to do X by 30. Y by 30. And I'm in a place now where I did all of that grinding. And I've done pretty much everything I've wanted to do by 30. I think the only thing that I wrote down is I wanted to be a millionaire by 30. And I'm doing pretty good. You know, I'm a, a, couple, a few hundred thousand there. And if you, and that's just in revenue, but if I add my assets, my home and um, other things that assets that I have, I'm doing pretty all right. <laughs> and so if I'm a millionaire at 30 or at 31 or at 35, that is okay too. But I'm in a season right now where my focus assigned to me by God and that I'm really excited about though is being more patient. And so this book really came up at a, a perfect time for me because I want to switch my pace. I'm on a quest right now to live a life full of peace and pace. Because what comes with that grind mentality and a grind mindset is anxiety, pressure, stress. Stress kills you. And so I'm in a space where I'm trying to get, a, get off of that and really move with peace and with pace. And my faith has helped tremendously with that because I'm understanding that it is not up to me to make things happen in my life. It's up to me to surrender to God, do what he tells me to do and just obey the small part that I play in his plan. That was a mouthful, mouthful but I want to play my small part in his plan. And by taking myself away from being responsible for the result, that takes a lot of the pressure and the anxiety off of me. And there are a lot of you guys who listen to this, this podcast, and I've seen it in my Instagram comments where you're generational curse breakers. And, you know, you have this pressure to be the first to do this, or you're the person in your family that's going to do all of these things. Yes, those things are great. 
but you're not God. And you're not going to be the one that makes those things happen. You're just the vessel that God is going to use for those breakthroughs. And so once you get yourself out the way <laughs> and let God be God and only obey whatever instruction that he gives you to do um, or only do that small part that he's calling you to play in it, it takes a lot of that pressure off. And so, again, I'm in a space right now where I'm trying to move in peace and in pace. And so that led me to read in this book. This book is phenomenal. I'll put the link in the uh, my Amazon store or whatever. The link will be in the show notes by the time this comes out. So as I'm getting to the end of this book, um, I started implementing a lot of the things that it talked about because for me, I'm a practical person. And in order for me to really live out this life of peace and pace, I'm going to have to change the way that I've been living life for my whole adult life up until this point. And so one of the things that I really trying to implement, I ain't got there yet, I'm trying to figure it out, is um, the Sabbath. And so in that particular section of the book, when it came to the Sabbath, he was talking about using the Sabbath, and it doesn't have to be a Sunday, it can be one day out the week is what he was saying, but take a day out of the week and let that be a day of worship. It can be you going into church, it can be whatever it is that you need to do to remind yourself of how great God is and to worship him. So it can be a day of, he talked about um, doing certain things with his family where they were, I think that's something about like eating cookies or something together, but just something where he was spending quality time with his family. And I never heard anybody talk about the Sabbath in that way, just using it as a, a day to worship God. And allowing what that looks like to be contingent upon whatever you, whatever that looks like for you, that made it really exciting for me to really figure out what is the Sabbath going to be for me? What are, how am I going to set apart time one day a week to where my day is dedicated to worship? Um, so I'm excited about that. I'll keep you guys posted on what that looks like. I haven't figured it out just yet. I know um, something I already practice is just keeping track record of God's blessings and all of those things and answer prayers so that I can maintain a, a, a spirit of just humility and worship on a day to day. But um, that book really just exposed me to dang, I need to think more about this so that I can make sure that time where I'm slowing down, like that whole day where I'm slowing down and really just having a day of gratitude. But nevertheless, as I was reading that chapter, he has said something about, he said this, this sentence of, we worry about what we worship. And I had to stop it right there. I closed the book like, man, that, that hit kind of hard. We worry about what we worship. I had to close the book because I couldn't keep reading after that. I had to take a, st a, a step back and take a second to really let that sink in because it, it hit me a little bit hard. So me being me. I get to looking words up because I'm trying to get to the root of why this, why this sentence hit me the way that it did. And so when I looked up the definition of worry, and I looked this up in the back of my Bible, there's a concordance um, that defines all of the words. And then, of course, gives you different scripture references. So I'm not using a dictionary definition. I'm using the concordance definition. So worry in the Bible is defined as is a noun and is defined as mental distress or agitation resulting from concern. Um, and another word for that is anxiety. And it says to feel or experience concern or anxiety. So if any of you guys identify with a sense of anxiousness or having some sort of anxiety, I really want you to pay attention to this concept because I believe it's going to what I'm going to talk about is going to provide you with a strategy or a tool that you can use to get you out of that worrying and get you into worshiping God and not the thing that's causing you to be worried. Now, I want to be very clear because when I'm talking about anxiety, I'm talking about the general anxiousness that happens as a result of us being under stress. What I am not talking about is a mental health disorder. There's a difference. I am not a mental health professional, and I believe that if you experience anxiety as a mental health disorder, you should seek a mental health professional to give you a clinical perspective on how to overcome 
that mental health disorder. There, many of us experience anxiousness without anxiety being a mental health disorder. And I, I have to draw the line between the two because I don't want to be irresponsible in talking about this. And so I want to be clear. Usually, if in to provide a little bit of context about what the difference is, when you have anxiety, one of the ways that you can tell if it's an anxiety, if it's potentially an anxiety disorder, or if you're just feeling anxiousness, is usually uh, anxiousness presents itself as a result of some sort of concern or stressor. And usually, when the stressor or concern is removed then the anxiety is removed as well. For example, if you are unemployed and you are worried about money, you have some anxiety about if your bills are going to get paid because you don't have a check coming in and that's what's causing anxiety, then you get a job and that concern and uh, is removed and now you're not anxious anymore. That's just that general anxiety that most people experience as a result of stress. If you're in a situation, same example, where you're um, experiencing anxiety because you are unemployed, you're worried about where your next check is coming from, you get a job, and then the anxiety is still there, even after the stressor has been removed, and there's no stressor to apply that anxiety that you feel to, then that may be an indicator of an anxiety disorder, which is a mental health concern that you should see a professional um, in order to treat. So again, I wanted to just be clear and provide a little distinction because I don't want to be irresponsible in talking about mental health concerns um, because I, I believe very much so in seeking a mental health professional. Um, I believe that you can pray and go to therapy. I believe that you can love the Lord and be on medication for whatever uh, mental health disorder that you have. And I am one of them people that's going be out here acting like you can't do both because you can. Um, shout out to the Therapy as a Christian podcast. Shameless plug of one of our clients. Um, listen to that to get more info as far as how to seek mental health support as a Christian. But nevertheless, again, I had to give that distinction because your girl try to be as responsible as I can be on this platform. So what we're dealing with here is that general anxiety that most people feel when a stress is present. Got it? Cool. So after I looked up worry, and so we'll call worry anxiety, um, I looked up worship. So worship means to regard with extravagant respect, honor, and devotion. And I thought about the scripture that is in a couple of the gospels where Jesus says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So when you worship something, you serve it. You have a devotion to it. You hold it with great extravagant respect and honor. That is the place that God should be. But when we are experiencing worry, what happens is we take God out of his place and we make that thing that we're worrying about our God. And then we start to make decisions and make moves based off of our, what we're truly worshiping in that moment, which is money, health, future, um, relationships, job security, whatever that thing may be. And this may not be a big deal to y'all, but this was big for me because I have a tendency to stress myself out over things and worry about things that I don't need to be worried about because I serve a God who is Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Tishkanu, Jehovah Jireh, whatever I need God to be, he is. So whenever I'm stressed, that is an indicator that I have taken God out of his rightful place as to who my devotion and my worship and my extravagant respect goes to and now have replaced him with something else. And that was big for me because we're living this thing out every day. We got to, I believe in taking things day by day. The Bible says don't worry about tomorrow. Today has, has enough trouble of its own. And so anytime that I can find a strategy that's going to keep me in alignment and not have me anxious about things or stressed or worried about things I don't need to be worried about, I get excited. 
Because again, I am on a mission to move in peace and pace, okay? In this new decade of my life, peace and pace. And worry robs me of the peace that is mine. I serve the Prince of Peace. He said that he will give me a peace that surpasses all understanding. He says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, the peace of God, not the peace of Tatum, the peace of God that tr which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so again, if you find yourself dealing with the stresses of life, the worries of life, which for most are worrying about the future, especially in the times that we're in right now with this COVID-19, 2021 20, and 22 pandemic. <laughs> a lot of us worry about the future. And even along those lines, we worry about health. As you get older, health may be um, something that is a more concern. Um, we, a lot of people worry about money. These are like the top three things people worried about according to psychologytoday.com. And so I believe, of course, it's normal for us to worry about things, but that needs to be a signal of, uh oh, something's off. Time for me to reel myself in, pull myself back together. Because there's, I, I've talked about this before, I feel like there's this delicate period where when a thought comes into our head, you have a very short amount of time to accept or reject that thought. And what you ex when you accept that thought, and if it's not in alignment with the word of God, you're now creating a stronghold, a belief system that's going to take a very that's going to take a lot of work in order for you to break away from. And so I believe just winning a big part of winning the battlefield of your mind, a big part of defeating those nagging thoughts or those limiting beliefs or those things that the enemy throws at you to try to get you to accept as true is to examine it before you decide what to do with it. One of my favorite books is um, The Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer. And so in that book, she talks about thinking, think about what you're thinking about. So when worry pops up in your mind, it's like, oh, do this, uh-uh, no. This is against the peace that surpasses all understanding that God said that he's gonna give me. So this needs to get tossed out because once it becomes something that makes me anxious and has enough control over my emotions to dictate how I feel and the level of stress I'm experiencing, now it's becoming something that I'm worshiping when it should have been something that got casted out as soon as it tried to uh, present itself. And I hope I'm being clear because I, I'm telling you, this is as practical as I can get when it comes to living out a life of peace and pace, a life in alignment with the promises of God. And to take it a step further, one of the things that I love, um, and we did this in our new limited edition prayer journal. If you go to blessedbossup.com, um, it's there for pre-order. One of the things I switched up in the old journal was um, I added now something that says, I declare because. And the Bible says that we can um, decree a thing and it'll be established. Um, and so that's what the declarations are, is an opportunity for us to declare the things of God. And uh, I feel like a lot of us use affirmations and things to speak life in. That's cool. But for me, I'm trying to speak the, the word of God, the truth that's powerful then or sharper than any double-edged sword. Like if I'm going to speak it, then baby, I'm speaking the most potent words okay so um what this concept means to me and it's similar to i feel but i know so if you have the last prayer journal or if you follow us on instagram we do a lot of i feel but i know posts but the concept is the same is to replace what the enemy is trying to plant um is to cast that thought out and replace it with the truth which is the word of god and so this is something an exercise that i want you to do this week yeah y'all got homework in addition to going to read in Habakkuk, y'all have more homework. And that homework is this week, I want you to take inventory of your thoughts. Anytime you something pops up that makes you worry, causes stress, um, anything, any type of concern, mental distress or agitation, any of these things are symptoms that something is trying to plant itself 
and uproot your devotion to God. Something is trying to become the God in your life with a lowercase g. And this and this should be like, hey, intruder alert, intruder alert. That's what needs to go off in your mind when this happens. Intruder alert. No, nope, mm -mm, I'm, I'm casting that out because I'm going to worship God and I'm not worshiping money. I'm not worshiping health. I'm not worshiping my future. I'm going to put my hope and my trust in him because he supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, I am healed. I could trample upon lions and serpents. And I won't so much as hit my foot on a stone. The Bible got bars, okay? <laughs> there is something for every intruder. So we have to cast those intruders out. And make sure God maintains our worship and our devotion. And so that was good to me. I don't know if that was good to y'all, but that was good to me. Because we live in these bodies and we live in this world that wants us to not go back to God and ask questions. That wants us to accept things that are not our truth. That wants us to feel like this is our fate. No. We have to stand on the promises of God and put our hope and our confidence and our trust in that. So I hope you guys enjoyed that revelation as much as I did. Um, again, your homework is to read Habakkuk as, Habakkuk as well as uh, take inventory on your thoughts this week and let anything that gives you these symptoms, mental distress, agitation, anxiety, concern, when you feel that, I want you to hear in your head, intruder alert, intruder alert. And then go and find the truth to counteract that lie. And you can do that by going into your Bible, going to the back, finding the subject, allowing it to take you to the scriptures that align around that. You can um, use the online tools that I mentioned, but y'all, we're going to live. This is not just. This may be what I'm saying is my theme for my 30s, but I'm sharing it with you because I believe we all should live a life of peace and pace. So thank you guys so much for listening to another episode of the Blessed and Bossed Up podcast. I will talk to you guys next week. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can check out all the video podcasts there. Um, I love you guys and I will talk to you next week. Bye.